Okay. Um, you guys need your agendas. Oh, yeah, I'm bring it up in the phone, but that works. Thank you. Um, so we'll call the meeting to order at <coughs> 7.02. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Um, I'd like to, I have one question that I was just starting to get into. Um, I'd like to know how many classrooms are short the smart board and what the time frame is on getting them, the new ones in there. Okay. Um, do you Doesn't have to be complicated or just. Why don't we just do that during board comment? You can okay. bring that question up. Um, okay, uh, then we'll move to the consent agenda to approve the minutes of Tuesday, October 17th. Um, regular meeting and the meeting minutes of Tuesday, October 19th, special board retreat. Favor say aye. 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 Peggy and Rodney, are you guys? Uh... Yeah, we're good. I, aye. Okay. Are you there, Peggy? Okay. Well, we certainly have enough to. She was doing her chicken chores. What's that? Doing her chicken chores and we're in her pocket. Okay. All right, well, the minutes are approved. I'll move to public comment correspondence. Is there any public comment at the moment? Okay. Can, can, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I, 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 I would abstain from voting on the minutes because I wasn't there for them anyway. Okay. All right, then uh, we'll move to board comments. Uh, just, uh, I'd like to know how many of those smart boards we have down, and maybe we can get some kind of idea of when we're going to have them up. Like, I'm not asking for the answer now, but <laughs> like, how many actually do we have? And well, let's see what Jamie, Jamie has. To okay. Say. So we're actually leveraging ESSER funds to replace all the smart boards throughout all the, the SU with interactive televisions that um, function just like a smart board, but it's an, interaction, an interactive monitor. And so those are going up throughout all of our schools and have to be in place by the end of this coming summer. Okay. So Ray can speak to exactly what the timeline is, and I'm happy to have him email okay. the board. It's just a new question to me, and it's just been given to me, so. Yeah, no, I'll ask Ray to, to update the board at the full board meeting. Awesome. But also to email it out to the rug board. Awesome. Okay. Any other board comments? <clears throat> I mean, um, it... Yeah, I, I have a comment. Uh, I, I went to the RTCC board meeting they have like four of them a year yeah uh, I attended the last one November 8th and everything's going good there and uh, they're actually adding a couple more courses we're gonna try to add a couple more courses for next year uh, one on like veterinary clinic taking care of animals type thing and another one that's like I think it was psychology I was just looking for my notes I can't find them but uh, I think one on psychology and one on animal care. So that's that's about it for them. Let's see, the animal care one will be well appreciated by the veterinary community. <laughs> right, and it's you know basically it's an introduction to veterinary care. Yeah. Care, cool. you know. So, so uh, that, yeah, everything seems to be going good with the RTCC people. That's it. Thanks. I think I just had a, a question, and, and 
maybe it's not even a question, but the uh, I think everybody kind of got caught with some of the weather that we had the other day, but it seemed like our school parking lots were pretty icy the other day. Um, and the only reason why I just asked the question is with our um, lawn care and our winter bids here lately, we've kind of been like, you know, we're waiting for the lawn bid to come in, but we, you know, we did a three who's combined three years. So we're, we're, we're covered. It's just it, a matter of, it just caught Jacob. Jacob okay. was actually at the Bethel campus moving wood chips for us. I think it just got caught him off. Okay. Too. Well, I just got thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm hoping we're not like, you know, no. laps on getting, getting something in there, but it was pretty, it was, at both campuses, they were, it was pretty slippery. slippery. Tractor parked right out front now. Yeah. Ready for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ready okay. For the night. So those were three year contracts that we had done both for, mm -hmm. For summer and winter maintenance, okay. all combined. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, unless there's more board comment, we'll move to the celebration of learning. So I should have let Christy know we updated the. We'll, we'll hear about foundations and Hegarty eventually. It's actually Kathy Fector shared a celebration of learning on design thinking, um, and so that was what I wanted to share. I want to make sure you have that, Parker. Do you have it? I'm looking for it. I don't see it in I'm going to send it to you. Or I can do it from my computer. I'm just going to make sure it's shared with you so you can. I know it was shared with Ray. I didn't know you were going to be here. Sorry. It would be fair. It's not usually me. So. Did you get the link? I did. Awesome. So you'll have to wait for Foundations Integrity for next week or next month. Sounds good. English language arts to grades three, four, and five at White River Valley Schools Bethel campus. This summer at Create Make Learn's Summer Institute workshop, I learned about a human-centered approach to problem solving called design thinking. Design thinking has been around for decades. Countless successful companies have used design thinking to engineer innovative products. But only more recently has design thinking made its entry into classrooms for hands-on learning. As I planned for the beginning of this school year, I searched for a pro project that would build classroom community by having kids start to get to know each other. I wanted something that was accessible to all students, develop transferable skills, and as a bonus, would generate authentic and engaged writing. A design thinking challenge called Design a Utensil was perfect for meeting these goals. Kids designed a utensil for their partner to help their partner eat a favorite food. The project took students through each of design thinking's five stages, empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Students worked in pairs. First, they interviewed each other about their favorite food and took notes on what problems their partners had eating their favorite food. This is the empathy stage, where the designer finds out the user's needs. This requires listening, communication, and note-taking. For example, Rhea and Perrin were partners. During the interview, Perrin found out that Rhea likes tacos, but they fall apart when she eats them. Next, in the define stage, Perrin defined the problem that his user, Rhea, needed him to solve. This was tricky. Kids kept repeating the problem instead of defining it. It wasn't enough to say Rhea needs her taco to not fall apart. 
Instead, the definition of the problem in design thinking terms was that Rhea needed her taco to stay together. Kids struggled to understand the distinction, which is good. We call that productive struggle. There were a lot of light bulb moments in this stage as students realized the distinction between repeating a problem and using design thinking to define it. After students defined the problem, they entered the ideate stage where designers allow their creativity to run wild. Students sketched out four ideas for solving their users' problem. From there, they narrowed it down to one idea to build. The prototype stage was next, where designers build a 3D prototype of their design. Excitement, frustration, and perseverance, our room had all of these going on at all times during prototyping. Growth mindset was key. We only had cardboard, cardboard tape, and recycled materials to work with. Kids shared materials, consulted each other for help, and encouraged each other when their prototypes fell apart. Finally, it was time for the test stage where designers test their prototypes to see how well they work. Problem was, we couldn't put food into these cardboard prototypes. No worries. Instead, students tested their prototypes by getting feedback from their users on how well they thought the prototype would work and what to do to improve it. Students wrote reflections on each stage of the process. It required them to put a lot of thought into how to describe and explain their thinking. We finished the project in time to enter a display of our inventions in the Tunbridge Fair. We won a blue ribbon. As if that wasn't enough, Create Make Learns director Lucy De La Brewer invited us to create a podcast about our design thinking project. So this extended their reflection and learning. Welcome to the Create Make Learn podcast where we travel to schools around Vermont to find out how they are learning through creating and making. Today, we are at Bethel Elementary School, where students kicked off the school year learning about design thinking. Our guests on today's episode will be Miss Kathy Fetker and her grade four and five students. Lucy and I interviewed each one of 50 students. Kids prepared for the interview, wrote scripts, and rehearsed. When they stepped up to the Blue Yeti podcasting microphone to speak in front of the whole class, they knew every word was being recorded for the public. There was so much footage, it took three episodes to cover it all. And if you can believe it, kids hosted the last episode, which will air this week. Welcome to episode three of Create Make Learns Design Thinking podcast. Ms. Fector and Lucy asked us kids to host this final episode about our design thinking project. My name is Sky. And I'm Elsie. We're here to talk about the last stage of design thinking, the testing stage. Inventors test their prototypes to see how well their prototypes work. I was invited to present and demonstrate this design thinking project at Vermont Fest in early November. It was exciting to see other educators inspired by my class. Design thinking builds clear and effective communication and creative and practical problem solving. It gives students a platform for purposeful writing. As memorable as this entire project was, there was one point of the project that actually got me all choked up. Lucy and I asked kids one question they hadn't prepared for. We asked them, if they had a team of experts and an unlimited supply of materials, what problem would they solve with design thinking? Their answers were genuine and powerful. Here's one example. So Cora, let's say you're given money and a team of experts. Um, and you can invent anything you want, what type of problem would you solve? Um, I would solve kind of like like the problem of people being homeless or houseless. Um, I would kind of create like a machine that could find like recycled parts or use stuff or trash to make <coughs> tiny houses that can be like port transported anywhere to like the side of a beach or 
like on the side of the road somewhere that has like solar panel heating or stuff like that and electricity. Oh my gosh, very amazing. I'm Zoe and that wraps up our podcast, right Bryce? Right Zoe, our class really liked our design thinking project and our class helps you have really liked hearing about it. Thank Thank you you for listening. (coughs) I am very proud of the learning, connection, and growth my students experienced through this design thinking project. If you're interested in hearing the podcast, head to createmakelearn.blogspot.com. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to celebrate their learning with you. What I appreciated the most, I mean, I appreciate all the work uh, that Kathy's gone into it, but I I appreciate in reflection the connection between her summer learning, you know, this is a class she took in the summer, how she, as a literacy teacher, figured out how she could fold it in and make it work, um, and just how she brought it into the connection to the greater world for the podcast, so very exciting stuff. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. (laughs) Thank you. I like that last question where you take it something you learned at school and kind of like bring it forward. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm gonna end here. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right, anybody have any questions about that or comments on the celebration of learning? Is there any chance that we can access that? I, I wouldn't mind watching it again. And yeah, I think they all get uploaded to the WRVSU website eventually. Okay. So there's a whole, yeah, you can watch you can look back to past celebrations of learning there. By school, they're listed. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. Thanks. We'll probably also share it on the Facebook page, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely do that. Will do. Great. Um, then we're on to the superintendent report. Jamie. It's hard to follow those, those types of celebrations of learning. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's the second time I've been able to, to watch that video, and that, this time without any interruptions. It's just so powerful. Uh, so I'll send Kathy a note as well, Andrea. Um, <clears throat> so uh, really what I wanted to add to my report is I don't know how many board members were able to attend the Act 127 uh, training that the VSA and VSBA held um, last week. A video did just come out. That's on the VSBA website. I'll send that with the, I'll share that with the full board tomorrow morning um, in case you haven't. Um, You know, what I would say is it gave a good 10,000 foot view of Act 127 and how ed funding is changing, uh, specifically going from equalized pupils to a uh, long term average uh, average, um, daily membership that's weighted. Um, which will increase the tax capacity for the White River Unified District. Um, and we've known that throughout, that this is that the White River Unified District was going to be one of the districts in the SU that was going to gain the most. The problem is, is that within Act 127, many districts lost tax capacity. And so what they did is the legislature provided a 5% cap on taxes uh, being able to increase for those districts that lost capacity. Uh, due to the new bill. And so with all that said, the Ed Fund still has to generate um, the difference between a 5% tax cap for a district that has that because they lost students um, and what their actual budget is going to be this coming year. And so my estimation is going to be that the yield, we are going to see a significant drop in our yield in order to balance the Ed Fund. Uh, which I do believe is going to result in districts like ours where we were supposed to gain some tax capacity, not actually seeing what they originally thought we would in these first few years. Um, So the yield, I think, is going to be something that we need to watch very closely because, um, you know, my sense is, is that the agency and the legislature is just starting to wrap their head around how much this uh, bill may actually impact the Ed Fund this coming year with that cap. 
there were some misunderstandings around the cap. I know that at the agency level, um, they thought that it was a hard cap and that then districts were going to have to figure out how to fund anything over the 5%, but actually, indeed, it's not that. Um, it, it, it provides you to gradually make those adjustments um, over the upcoming years. And so that, that difference is going to have to be found somewhere. And my sense is it's going to be found uh, within the Ed Fund by a decreased yield. So those are some updates on 127. You'll see in the training, there was some talk about what I just said. I don't think uh, our presenters were frank enough about talking about how much the yield may actually be impacted. Um, but my sense is it's going to be impacted um, pretty significantly. So it's something that you'll will be watching closely. We will have that number, that projected number in December. And as you know, we continue to adjust once the legislature uh, takes session based on information we're gathering from them. Um, and then, you know, the, my final statement around all this, which is also a concern for me, is that Brad James at the agency, who's been there several decades um, in the finance office, is retiring here in a few weeks. Um, and most of this algorithm and work that was done around this long term average daily uh, waiting was done by Brad. Um, and, you know, they, they will have someone replacing Brad, but it's just he has a lot of historical perspective and knowledge. Um, so that's worth note as well. And I'll entertain any questions folks may have. I have been covering for uh, Principal Thomas. He'll be back next week after Thanksgiving. I've been at the high school for the last several days, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to serve uh, at the Royalton campus uh, in partnership with Andrea and, uh, you know, to to fill my like my principal void. So it, it's been a good uh, last week or so at uh, the high school and um, the turkey trot today was a great success. And uh, in general, it's, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Um, with the 5% cap, is that basically go up 5% each year? Yep, over the next five, yep. And did you have a sense of like what percent our equalized pupils would be changing? And we're our, going we're going, our, our pupils, we just got the hard numbers finally from the agency a couple of weeks ago. We're going to see, uh, I mean, quite a gain, um, like uh, almost pushing two thirds, Andrew, um, mm -hmm. of our, our pupils. So that's good news. And um, you may say, well, why are we gaining that much? So the things they take into account are um, middle school students now count for more than one. If you remember with equalized pupils, they only used to count for one. They have recognized that it costs more to educate middle school students. Uh, they look at rural districts and population uh, within rural districts. And so you get to count some additional waiting for those districts that count for being rural. Uh, there is a merger fund incentive still based in the, the waiting of the pupils. High school students count for more than they did prior as well. Uh, and then English uh, um, language learners count for more than they have in the past. Um, so all those things have resulted in us increasing our, our capacity based on the pupils. I'm just really concerned that a dropped yield may make up all of that, the difference. And we're really back to where we were. Uh, do you know the 5% cap, is that, that's just on the effect of the yield, not like- That's on the tax rate. On the tax rate. So if they increase their spending, they could just be capped at 5%? That's correct. Seems like a mm. flaw. It's <laughs> why I'm really fired up about it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Tara and Andrew hear me talk about this and Pure does every admin meeting. And I've been talking about this at the VSA level now when I realized that that was fully how this bill um, was passed and put into legislation for the last six weeks. Uh, it was a major flaw, and I think it's going to really result in a real shortfall in our Ed Fund. Does that mean that we're capped at 5% too, so we can't have more than 5% increase? We are capped at a 5% tax increase. If our pupil spending went over 10%, and this is for any district, if your, your pupil spending went up 10%, you then have to go in front of a panel 
that is made up of three superintendents and three business managers who then will make a recommendation to the secretary of ed about um, whether or not there's justification for your budget to go up that much. Uh, for so some districts lost pupils. Um, there are districts that lost as much as 100 pupils from equalized pupils to this new weighting formula. Um, and so their spending very well could be over the 10% threshold. There is a pen penalty for the 10% threshold for that those individual districts if they cannot justify why they spent um, that much. And that panel is going to make a recommendation to the Secretary of Ed. And then the Secretary of Ed has the ability to make that decision. But I guess I, my question was like, if the yield was completely, you know, offsetting everything, we wound up with a 5% increase because it completely offset our equalized pupils, we'd be capped at that and it wouldn't. Correct. And then my worry then is how are they making up the, the difference in this ed fund? And I think that's what they haven't figured out. My sense is that this very well may result in the legislature needing to relook at this. I actually brought this up um, to Senator McDon um, McDonald here when I've seen him recently. Um, I just, I, I have some real concerns that that piece, uh, they didn't realize that, that many district budgets what I'm hearing is budgets are up anywhere from 12.5% to 20% in the expenditure side in some of our neighboring districts. Um, that is going to result in them being over this cap. Yeah, it seems like it would have been easy enough just to say, like, the pupils can't decrease by more than 5% a year or something like that. And just, you know, have the impact of the pupils be 5%, but whatever spending happens, happen separately from that. So it seems like a pretty easy fix. I'm with you. And, <laughs> and I hope that they take immediate action on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody have anything else for Jamie? Um, that's more than I had to ask. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Principal's report. And it appears online. I'll just go over the elementary <coughs> sections real quick. Um, I think that the highlights of our report just is about professional development and some of the professional development and training that our staff is taking. Uh, also, what we're going over in staff meetings as far as the literacy and math frameworks from the SU. Um, and just updating you on what our Wildcat groups are doing on, on Fridays with focuses on um, the character strengths. Uh, and then I would say that the, the section I'm the most proud of is the last section. We, um, Tiffany Bates did a lovely job of honor, honoring some of our veterans at the South Royalton campus. So that was a really great feel good event to be part of. And um, the kids did a good job of keeping it a big secret. So that was <laughs> super fun. Uh, we did our relocation and bus uh, evacuation drills. We've been super busy. We had Barn Arts do um, an artist in residency workshop for our four fives together over on the Bethel campus, and then the whole school came together over in Bethel to, um, to enjoy his performance. Uh, we had our book fair, our conferences, our first concert and art show of the season, our first harvest luncheon. And then finally, I think the thing I'm most excited about is our conference rate. We went up from last fall 83% attendance rate to 94. And it might even be higher because I know teachers were still rescheduling. So that's it in a nutshell. In fast breath, there's a lot going on. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know Pierre will probably want to highlight his section. I did like the uh, book fair doing using the local book. Yeah, store. that was great. I'm super thankful to the the Royalton PTO for pushing us to go in that direction, and uh, some of the members met with the brand new um, librarians right off, and the librarians went with it. So I think it's great. Okay. I think the parents appreciated less junk. <laughs> That was the feedback we got. Yes. <laughs> no, no posters, no junk, <laughs> just books. <laughs> I don't know if the kids appreciated it as much. <laughs> they did not. 
I know. <laughs> <clears throat> the young ones, especially. Uh, I'm super clear. <laughs> There was no Ferrari posters and invisible ink pens, I and that know. was a war crime that there was no kitsch. Yeah. I sort of understand. <laughs> Parents can take a trip to the dollar store, it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pierre, do you have, want to high, highlight any of your section? Score. Thank you, Andra. Good evening, folks. I think we have a lot of parallel um, good things going on in the middle school. Uh, we continue to develop a tier system of supports by looking at data and how it creates that sustainable cycle of looking at appropriate interventions. In the past couple of weeks, we've really been focused on kind of social emotional behavioral types of data, looking at student conduct, how to improve overall climate and accountability in the school. We're going to be resetting some expectations, working directly with all students uh, coming back from the break. So it's not just academic data that we're working with to inform our instruction. Um, I'd really like to just spend a moment highlighting the last section of my principal report. We've had a lot of really good community events going on. Uh, we too had our first music concert of the year held right after the elementary school. We had a week full of student-led conferences. Our participation rate was somewhere uh, north of 80% waiting for the last three schedules, we anticipate almost 85% uh, participation. Um, I think overall, something to bear in mind is between all of these events that we've had between elementary and middle school, uh, in the past couple of weeks, we've had anywhere conservatively more than 400 to liberally more than 600 people come through our doors to participate in some kind of uh, community conversation or performance that we had going on in the school. I really want to highlight uh, how we've been able to open it up to some interesting cultural events and discussions. Thank you, folks. Community conversation? Yes. Yeah, I, I really I, wanted to go, just was traveling. So. No, it was, it was wonderful. It was a fantastic turnout. Good, because yeah, that's increasing the community. Mm -hmm. Engagement is one of the things we were talking about at our um, retreat. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. All right. I'd say for that event specifically, we had, um, again, north of 50, almost 60 people at any one time engaged in the conversation and the group work the community members are doing. Great. It was a nice mix also. It, it, there was there were some young family people there and a lot of gray hairs like me, but <laughs> uh, it, it was great to see that mix. Great. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions for the principals? Then uh, we're on to Tara. So you all have my report. It outlines what's happening in the business office for the month of November. So if there's any questions, I'll happily answer that. Otherwise, I uh, spoke with the auditors today, um, updating, and they are working through getting the first draft of financial statements together. Great. Good. Seems ahead of schedule. <laughs> yes. Awesome. They're a great team. They have been awesome to work with. Good. So very excited to have that impression. <laughs> <laughs> um, unless there are any questions for Tara, uh, we'll go to the policy committee update. Rodney? Do we have any update from the policy committee? No, actually I don't. Uh, I'm trying to think what we talked about the last time we went, and I don't remember. I don't. I don't have any notes on it or anything. Uh, do you have it on, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, we're we're currently started by reviewing uh, all of our personnel policies, um, and so there are six right now that the group's looking at. We've got three in front of legal for revisions. Um, we have three more we'll review this coming meeting. So I suspect that you're going to see some revisions coming out of the personnel policies, which are all the B policies, um, for readings here in the next month or so. 
And we're at a place of, of really reviewing and revising our current policies that we have on the books. All right. Um, so the task force update. Let's speak to that, Chris. Sure. Uh, we met um, yesterday. Um, so uh, building update wise, we have um, the the pellet boiler system is in process of being installed in Bethel. I, I believe he said mid mid December they hope to have it online. Um, and then there's a bit of a test cycle for a week or two. So hopefully by the end of December, it's fully operational. Um, lighting wise, they are, uh, I can't remember what school they were finishing up, but they were, they're coming to Bethel next. Um, where were they in Sharon? I think, and they're like 60% done in Sharon. Was that right? And then they're we're going finishing to finishing up, um, Newton. Oh, Newton. And then they're heading to Bethel. So. Uh, it, it sounded like probably about a two-week time period before the land in Bethel to, to start the lighting there. Um, th so those are some of the projects that we have ongoing. Um, we did uh, we did have our discussion in regards to our um, um, some of the items that we had on the retreat. So our, our planning. Um, so we ha we did talk to um, the engineer about. Uh, putting together a timeline, which we pretty much agreed on the timeline of what we want to see and, and by when. So right now we're looking at, um, we are going to have our next facility meeting. We hope to invite some donors or, or potential donors to our meeting to talk to them because it sounds like some of the donors right now want to want a little bit more information on what we're doing. Um, so we're putting together a, a meeting to allow the donors to to participate in that at our uh, committee. Um, we hope to have on December December's meeting. Um, we're looking at kind of presenting what that number is going to look like and and how that may look like in a bond, um, as well as um, Eric will be here uh, to kind of at a high level kind of present what what the project would look like and that includes um, that includes the um, the music and arts um, piece as well as the um, security and entrance piece and then the um, the uh, AC HVAC um, ventilation piece that we had talked about for the library and potentially the cafeteria here so um, so we kind of laid we kind of laid out a, a timeline of what we wanted to see and when. Um, the idea is to be able to um, January's meeting to to hopefully a, as a board is to make a decision on the project to move it forward um, or not. Um, and we we've given ourselves a little bit of leeway. So if we do have any any hiccups in the process in January, that we do have the February meeting to to uh, hopefully resolve those. And we'd like to at least have the board's commitment by, by the um, the March town meeting day, and and then that what that'll do that'll spur about a six to eight month window, where um, where we can really um, advertise the project, get more donors excited, mm -hmm. um, and then go for our bond vote in November. Um, so though pretty much in the nutshell what we were we were uh, we were talking on that it, it sounds again it still sounds very promising that that with the donors that we either have commit commitments or will have commitments with that are just lacking some details that we feel pretty confident on on raising the the, the third that we had talked about um, and then like we had talked about the retreat was potentially that once we cross that third threshold that any other money that they <clears throat> collect in donations could go directly to that facility and whatever, I'll make it up a, a, a sound system or, you know, uh, staging or different things that could be just directly um, related to that. So, so I think we had a pretty good meeting um, on that. Great. Yeah, I think that timing sounds good since it's great to be able to present things at town meeting or yep. school board meeting or both. I guess.
Well, thank you for that update. Anybody have any questions about that? Um, then we'll move to our discussion items. Uh, the draft number two of the student support and universal instruction, first draft of the universal instruction budget. So I'll just start by saying what I updated in draft two is health insurance went up 16.7%. And the new child care contribution tax goes into effect on January 1st, 2024. So I have now added that into your budgets and that tax for the first year is 0.44% per dollar earned. So that's in your first draft. And then I'll let your building administration discuss draft one of your general education. Just before, we, what was that tax again? It was child care contribution tax. And so that, uh, that's for contribution for the preschool. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. Your budget doesn't look like my budget. You need to look at the revised budget I sent out today. I know what I. The only cards. change to it from what was originally sent in the packet <laughs> is world language was moved back to 2.0 from yeah. 1.4. Yeah. Not my notes on your budget. If it if it's helpful, I can I can start, and then principals can can jump in too. Um, so student support, there were no changes to the FTEs from what you saw last month. Uh, reminder that the additions were made last month was to have a student support coordinator, uh, an additional one. We have three currently right now that would add a fourth one, so that we would have coverage of a student support coordinator at each elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. Um, to support our universal social emotional system and to help with some targeted plans. Um, and so that that's something that that was added last month when you saw it. The other thing is adding a school counselor secretary, which is what Principal Thomas talked to you about last month to assist our, our guidance counselor office. Um, those are the biggest increases in regards to the student support budget. Other than uh, our SAP counselors, we've been covering those with grants uh, prior. We're starting to try to budget for some of them locally um, to ensure that we can have SAP, SAP counselors in place. That would, right now, we currently have an SAP counselor that we're able to provide at the Royalton campus in Bethel um, if we were able to fill them both. And they're both currently right now completely grant funded this would be looking for us to bring one of those contracted services into your local budget uh, while we continue to use grant funding to cover the other person. Um, and then when you go down into your universal instruction, the biggest change that you're gonna see here um, in the principals, um, meaning the middle and high school principals can talk about this currently right now, we have a tech ed teacher that is shared uh, from the middle and high school and this budget proposes that we would increase um, to have a second tech ed teacher so that each campus had a full-time tech ed teacher, one at the middle school and one at the high school. And um, Pierre, I don't know if you wanna jump in and talk about that and, and Jeff's on, I don't know if he's able to speak or not, but he could speak to that too. Oh, and the other big piece too in student support, um, and I think this was mentioned last month, is that it did? It does um, ensure that we have intervention, a full-time uh, literacy and a full-time math interventionist um, at the middle school that are licensed um, interventionists. So, Pierre, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about um, tech ed. Sure. Um, so right now there are some limitation sharing that shop teacher between the two schools um, beyond logistics really looking at limited the kinds of offerings we could have for students um, for my campus that means we're not offering shop based or that kind of learning based um, flexible pathways in the afternoons uh, looking at how that relates to building a maker space that's intended to be a pretty big deal, a big project that's going to, uh, that students from any number of schools could access. We just think we can uh, reasonably justify a full position of a shop teacher who would also have some duties being the, for lack of a better word, champion of the design space. So someone that can do a number of flexible pathways, hands-on projects with students, 
uh, expand the offering so that we can look at effective use of our schedule time by having that particular discipline uh, available in the afternoon. I can let uh, Jeff Thomas speak to his campus. I would imagine he'll find very similar parallels beyond just the logistics of carrying a person. Uh, there is a, a substantial call for um, expanded offerings, and we believe this is a way to, to address that issue. You're muted. I feel like we're losing uh, several kids from vocational because they can't really start vocational school until sophomore, junior year. So some of these younger freshman students just have no option. And with Will only be in there in the afternoon, some of their schedules don't work for them. And so having a full-time uh, shop teacher, I think would really help these students um, fit in and then work their way to vocational school. Okay, um, are there any other highlights from the budget? Okay, does anybody have any comments on these two um, <coughs> updated budget proposals? It, it all sounds great, um, but until we have the entire budget together to figure out, you know, I mean, just looking at these two here, we're up 8%. Right. So, you know, we're talking about 5% and, you know, and, and yields going down. And so, I mean, it, I, I think it all, all sounds good. I mean, um, but until we have the entire budget put together to be able to see what does that look like finally, and, and if it doesn't look the way you want to see, then, then what, where do we have to go um, to potential cut um, pieces? But but uh, I think everything that we've talked about is things that make sense for the school and would be nice if, if we can afford it, so. I agree with Chris. Yeah. I'd love to have, I'd love to have another shop teacher. Yeah. That'd be awesome for us, but as long as we can afford it, it's always gonna be as long as we can afford it. <clears throat> yeah. what, what's the time frame on when we'll have the full version of the budget put together where we'll be able to start to see next month. So next month we'll have the full Good entire budget. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And that's when they come out with the projected yield. Yep. December 1st is when the projected yield comes out. They're supposed to have the final um, long-term membership for December 15th. Okay. That hasn't always happened in the last several years, but <laughs> we usually have an initial indication to start with. Yep. Well, I was just going to ask you, you do you have like a, do you get a whiff of like where it's going to go? Like. Well, we know we have initial projections, like Jamie mentioned yeah. as part of his report. We've had initial projections. They've been providing that throughout the last year as we've been working through learning and understanding what the change in the weights would be. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, to also retrain us to stop saying equalized pupil because it doesn't, it's not equalized pupil anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, yeah, so you'll change some of the slides in our. We have a whole lot of changes to make in our slides. <laughs> oh, no. You and I will spend hours fixing that. <laughs> wait, wait, control F, control R, control F, control R. Yeah. It is the frustrating part because I think, I feel like some of our constituents are just starting to understand yep. how ed funding have works, and now we've got another whole change. Yeah. Um, so. As long as the, you know, our number's going up by two thirds, that's great. <laughs> I'm okay with explaining some things. <clears throat> okay, yeah. I mean, I think my comments would be the same. Like, I think this is, it's good to kind of have this initial budget thing being what we think would be ideal, and then we can see what we can manage. Okay. So, all right. Thank you, Thank you for the projected budget. Uh, community Engagement Task Force. Yep. Any, uh, so we, we've had uh, one applicant. I feel like I've sort of dropped the ball on this in the sense of I feel like we need to push this out some more via social media. Um, and so I don't think we're necessarily ready to form the task force yet. 
Um, but I did want to just have a conversation with the board to get a sense of what board members might be interested. Um, and like I said, we do have a teacher that's interested uh, who is uh, a faculty member at the high school uh, and who has uh, children currently right now at First Branch and plans to have them come to our high school. So I think it's a really good perspective there. Um, but we still have some more outreach to do to really fill this, this group. So I, I would say we're not ready to actually form it tonight necessarily, but. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I, I had meant to post your letter to some things on Facebook as well and social media to push that as well, but it didn't happen, so. I think if we can try and spread the word and get people interested, that would help. I think there were some people that were were at last Friday's event that would probably be interested in it. We could probably get some names. The table I sat at that had some young family there, there was one couple just moved into town that have a young child that's not even in the system yet, but they seem really interested in getting to know more about Bethel and, and the whole community thing. Yeah, great. They, they'd probably be somebody that would be good. And, and I'd written down from the last discussion, Jamie, um, that we had looked at five areas, in a perfect world, five areas that we'd like to cover on that um, task force, which was uh, we talked about teachers, we talked about potentially having a board member be a part of that, um, uh, student, a student population piece, family, and then, and then some community members was kind of the how we were hoping to round that together. Um, I know on the community end of things, anything that you want to put out there, I'd be more than happy to sh share it with the town administration in Bethel to, you know, to use their uh, means of getting information out there to help out on that end. So uh, if you have something, Jamie, like an advertisement or something typed up, if you want to send it to me, I'll, I can forward that through the town of Bethel. Um, and, and maybe we have a contact with Royalton that can probably do the same thing and we could at least connect those community pieces, which usually will fall into the families. And then maybe somehow if we do some internal advertisement for the teachers, students, and you know, maybe a board member or something, you know, to get that piece of it done. So it sounds like we're we're not there yet. Yeah. Sounds so. like we'll do another month of advertising and hopefully get some more people interested and we'll have that on the agenda for next month. Mm. <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, do we have any public comment? I was Hi. just gonna... Go ahead, Tammy. Um, so I recognize that I am taking minutes and I tried to focus on some concepts here. Um, and, and I, but I also did not wanna interrupt the discussion. Um, for the WRUD facility task force, Chris, your update was helpful, but kind of confusing from someone who's not, um, I, I'll have to admit that I've missed some of the dialogues. And so you went from the contractor putting together a timeline um, to talking about the donors to provide the donors more info, um, and then talking about a blend of music and art, security, entrance, AC, HVAC for library and cafeteria. And you had identified the idea was to have a January 23rd or 24, sorry, board decision to move forward or not, maybe February 24 to resolve issues with the board's commitment in time for the March 24 meeting. What I'm confused by is the, how it all, like we talk about a bunch of different topics, music and arts, security and entrance, AC and HVAC for library and cafeteria. And so is the board decision 
open for January potentially on all of those concepts or is it just on um, the facilities? I, um, well, they're all blended together. I think the donor concept applies to the music and arts, but I might not understand all the concepts. So could you provide some clarification? Yeah, so, so the idea, Tammy, is um, uh, putting together a, a bond vote and the bond vote would include the um, arts and music um, addition that we're looking at doing, as well as the security and entranceway um, project and the uh, ventilation um, piece of it. So there's there's three pieces that we go together in the bond vote. Uh, yep. Now inside inside that we had we had talked about as a board in order to get the uh, music and arts facility off the ground that we had talked about coming up with some type of matching money uh, to show the community that we have. Um, some some good traction so we had talked about raising a third of the money of the potential uh, cost to show good faith to the voters um so that's where the donors come in okay uh, and an I, I was like that, wow i was confused i'm like wow we're raising there's so there's donors for security entrance and ventilation and i went gosh there's uh, there's something i was missing and i would okay. At the board retreat, we kind of looked at all of our facility needs and tried to do kind of a long term plan. And it made sense if we were going to be doing facilities work for this um, music expansion to all do those other things kind of at the same time, particularly the entrance, because that's, you know, you're modifying the exterior of that um, space anyway. But we are thinking about them as kind of different funding mechanisms. I mean, if they'd all be in the bond, but we're also going to be using some of the um, reserve funds that we've put aside over the last few years and, you know, donor money. So okay. but it was looking, at it, looking at it holistically to figure out kind of an overall plan, but the donor money would just be for the music portion. Of okay. It. Okay. That, um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Andrew. That helped me understand all of that a bit like I, I wouldn't be able to be an expert on it, but um, it was helpful to understand how that all came to er, those underlying concepts. So thank you. We hope to at the next meeting in December to lay that out um, a little more comprehensively uh, in December to, to understand what those pieces are and, you know, and, and then we'll actually be able to put some numbers to numbers it. Numbers. Good. They mentioned Yep, they mentioned it at the middle school program and likely the elementary school program as well. Um, and um, they they mentioned it, they being the teach the staff in mentioning it. I can't remember if they had a link or a website where they folks could go to. Did they? I don't think they did. And but yeah, Josh Josh did a really good job of plugging the whole thing though and and stressing to the parents. The children that are on stage tonight are the ones that are going to benefit from this. Oh, and <laughs> said is that that's coming. It just isn't yeah. here yet and to look for it and wait for it and we'll be putting it out. Yeah, but so he 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 definitely planted the seeds of it all. Yeah. Um and so there's going to be a high school performance I'm going to guess sometime in December. I haven't I'm not looking at my calendar. Um but the, with those seeds planted, um I it's just good to acknowledge how it all fits together whether well I, my initial question was on the overall board, the bond vote preparations, and it made sense to make a more global approach to that, but then how it all fit to the music um, um, and arts concept. So um, thank you. Um, that clarification and discussion was helpful. 1214 is when the next concert is for elementary and high school in Rockland. Okay. okay. And, and I just wanted to, um, I had these listed and didn't talk about them before, but just quickly, I just wanted to say I did, I did attend the, uh, the Bethel community discussion that was last Friday. Uh, what was kind of neat was we did have six students there, um, four high schoolers and two middle school um, that were in attendance. So it was nice to, to see some of the um, student population at attend that. Um, There'll, there'll be more detailed notes that will come out of that conversation here over the next couple of weeks, but some, a couple of things 
school wise that came up in there was um, there was some discussions about um, bringing more civics learning into the school yeah. um, that was kind of a hot topic um, as well as um, board members maybe potentially spending some time in the schools there yeah. was a conversation about you know, I don't know, I mean, maybe you come in and you have lunch with the kids or something. But there were, you know, some of that um, discussion was, was had um, uh, for the community um, piece. And then on a separate note, when I was, I was chatting with the, um, uh, some of the math teachers at the middle school, so I was just asking about how, how are things going with the added math time that we've uh, set aside for them, which which they thought that, you know, obviously that, that the added math time was needed and, and that we will see, will and are starting to see some um, benefits from that. And then I just kind of asked them, like, you know, if, if there was any tweaks to be made right now, you know, to, to accelerate that learning, you know, what else could we possibly do? And, and one thing that was common that came up for both of them was, and I wasn't really adverse to it, is currently, I guess math is being taught later in the day time, correct me if I'm wrong, but they had both said that <clears throat> a lot of times the things that you teach later in the day, students don't absorb it as well as they do in the morning. So, um, and maybe this is something for a bigger discussion, but so I got thinking of, you know, how could we maybe teach some of those core classes a little earlier in the day and then maybe some of the Maybe the, some of the teachings that don't require quite as a, the attention could we do after lunch? Or is there a way that maybe you alternate once in a while that, you know, some of the maths in the morning and then sometimes maths in the afternoon, you know, could you do that? But that was, that was kind of the one uh, takeaway that I had gotten from my um, parent-teacher conference, um, exploring some questions. So I don't know if that's come up before, Jamie or, or Pierre, but... Um, and I don't know even know if there's an opportunity to do something more there with the scheduling, but that was what was brought up to me. Yeah, no, I think um, looking at the <laughs> schedule is something that, you know, we've been talking about Pierre and I already, and I think it's something the faculty has been thinking about um, in order to like how we increase in capacity, are we best leveraging our resources? I would say one of the struggles I think we've had sometimes within that middle school schedule is just the sharing of some of our essential staff um, between middle school and high school uh, and middle school and elementary uh, and making that all fit. So thinking about phys ed, art, music, um, and- Staff and spaces, right? Yeah. I didn't say it was gonna be easy. I just, <laughs> just throw No, no, I appreciate it, Chris. No, I, I would say that those are what you are saying, what teachers are saying are certainly things that at least questions I've raised and questions I think admin, we've just been wrestling with, like what makes the most sense. I, I would also say one of the things I think we're looking for next year too is how do we increase more choice for our middle school kids, specifically our seventh and eighth graders around um, some of those electives. Um, instead of it always being a required like is are there a way to create more opportunities for some student choice within that schedule not in the core content but some of the other areas unfortunately it seems like you know somebody has to be at the end of the day no matter what when there's no, only two math teachers yeah. but we did attempt a rotating schedule at one point in my teaching career and the teachers had a really hard time with it. <laughs> the kids, they they adjusted really easily. And yeah. I actually had, a, I had, I remember one boy um, who came to me and said, I'm so glad you're finally going to see me in the morning sometimes because I'm at my best in the morning. And, <laughs> and in the afternoon when I usually have math, I know that my meds have worn off and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> and it was his self awareness was really amazing. And he was right. Once I started having him in a morning class, it was a whole different kid. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, even though a rotating schedule is kind of hard to do, it can be done. 
um, so that they're not always in that two o'clock class. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any other public comment? Um, and are there any new hires or resignations? Nope. Uh, we don't have any other. Uh, for future agenda items, uh, we need to do the community engagement task force again next month. Mm -hmm. um, I will be doing budget stuff. <coughs> the full budget hopefully next month and, and we'll be talking about the bond and the bond and yep. Yep. Or facilities work and, and we'll have I believe Eric Lafayette was gonna come to do kind of a high-level presentation you know we won't get into the weeds on all the little details but kind of a higher level you know what this will cost in a ballpark maybe we talked about maybe a couple of options like you know, here's kind of the bare bones model in here if you wanted to, some of the bells and whistles type deal. Yeah. And then we can talk a little more, how does that affect, or how would that potentially affect, you know, tax rates and things like that, but. Okay. And then your full budget. Yep. <laughs> and the full budget. We're gonna have a busy, busy month next month. All right, our next meeting date is Tuesday, December 19th. Um, at 7 p.m. at the Bethel campus. Um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.